And after those two sessions, we are joining for the keynote address, followed by a delicious lunch, though uh, I believe Professor Talapatro has also cooked a little bit of it, including myself. So we would all enjoy. And after that, you know, two, two more sessions, then we finish for the day. Tomorrow, we start at 11. Thank you so much for coming and making you know this enjoyable and occasion for us. The first speaker, you know, there are pros and cons. I hope in my case pros will over really con. <laughs> you see, I have been in my professional life, or it's not working. It's working. In my professional life, I was a hardcore economist. We used to do economic, econometric modeling. Since my retirement, I have changed my subject. Now, I have come to the area of applied religion. Now, normally religion is supposed to help us in our spiritual development. I wanted to find out what are the teachings of religion which will make our everyday life more efficient. In that manner, and in fact, how religion is going to affect the performance of our daily activities, both physical and mental. What I did in this paper, I took four major religions, Hinduism, Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism, and tried to find out what are the teachings of these religion for the most done mental activity for us is decision making. We make decision all the time, all the time. Small decision, big decision, single decision, group decision. So I wanted to find out what these religions have to say about good decision making. What are the lessons? Now one can identify four broad steps which are fundamental to any decision making process. The first step is to select an objective. You have to have a goal for decision making. Second, you have to find out about the alternatives, alternative actions which will lead to this goal. Thirdly, by some criterion, you have to choose one single action. You cannot choose all the actions one alternative we have to choose and fourth is the you know lesson from Bhagavad, Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita that you can have control on actions not on results so even the best options fail to be with the result yeah. uh, just a few uh, it's a wonderful presentation thank you for that uh, I just want to comment on your um, on one of the topics you covered which is the Hindu uh, yeah. viewpoint uh, all of them are very, very important, uh, but since the time is limited, I'll confine myself. You mentioned the Bhagavad Gita as one of the sources. So here are some of the main ideas in the Bhagavad Gita when it comes to making uh, decisions. Uh, uh, one of them is, uh, as is very well known, Loka Sangraha. You, you should take into account common good. Uh, Loka Sangraha means common good. That should be one of the factors you should take into account. Uh, and then another advice is follow the wise. You know, uh, Krishna tells Arjuna that uh, Janakala, that is, you know, these are some of the exemplary people, and uh, look at their lives. You know, what kind of situations they have been through and what kind of decisions they have made, and uh, use that as one of your guiding principles. So none of them are exclusively the only one, but he gives him uh, Arjuna, you know, the disciple, a bunch. Uh, of uh, guiding principles. So I mentioned one, Loka Sangraha, the other is follow the wise. Now here is a third one, Okay, so you should do your duties regardless of the consequences. So that's the third uh, guiding principle. The fourth one is Atmumpamandina Sarvatra. So you should be able, you should try to see yourself in everyone and everyone in yourself. That's the fourth guiding principle. Uh, here is the fifth one, Sukhadukhe Samei Pritva, Lava, Lava, Jaya, etc. So you should be, uh, you should try to get to a, a perspective where victory and defeat, uh, friends and foes, uh, are taken in the same way. 
And so, um, and then there is a lot of emphasis on building a strong virtuous character. The goal is to have a character which is similar to this, uh, a lamb that is burning straight up and is never moving this way or that way because there is no wind there. So those are some of the guiding principles in the Bhagavad Gita. Thank you for your famous commentary on the Brahma Sutra that no one entertains a doubt such as am I or not, nor makes the mistake that I am not. The cultural importance, the central importance of the topic of the self in the Indian, especially the Hindu tradition, is reflected in such common descriptions of the discipline as Atma Vada the reasoned discourse about the self, or Atma Vidya, the science of the self, and so on. The source literature in Sanskrit is vast and cannot be exhausted even in many, many lifetimes. So I have to be very selective in my presentation since the time is very limited, and I shall confine myself mainly to the viewpoints of uh, the Nyaya school of Indian philosophy, Hindu philosophy, and the Advaita Vedanta school. Of, uh, in the philosophy. And uh, there will be certain remarks about uh, Western philosophical views on these subjects um, uh, occasionally. Uh, we first consider the Advaita position that, that is highly influential in the Indian philosophical as well as religious and spiritual tradition. In the Advaita view, pure consciousness alone is real from the ultimate automatic standpoint. Thus, according to Shankaracharya, Consciousness is the absolute and eternal reality that is all pervasive and devoid of all change. So we're only about two minutes behind our schedule, which is not terrible. Um, okay, so we are going to hear from two people in this session. And so the first will be Professor Andrew Ward, followed by Professor Gordon Haste. And um, what we'll do, uh, oh, actually, what's interesting is here it's supposed to start at 1.30. Oh, and I'm told to finish at 3.15. Uh, OK, so I'm going to let you know in 30 minutes. Yes, that's right. Sure. OK, so we're going to start with Professor Andrew Ward from the University of York in the United Kingdom. And his topic is the survival of persons. And take it away, Professor York. OK. Ward. Ward. <laughs> I'm okay. Let, let me know if you, can, uh, if you can't hear me or if I'm speaking too, too loudly. Okay. According to a contemporary theory of personal identity known as psychological reductionism, this is a theory that was first put forward by a philosopher called Derek Parfit, who sadly died last year. It's also been put forward by a number of others, but now a, a well-known American philosopher, Sidney Shoemaker, put forward a view very much like it, but I'm going to be talking about Parfit's view of personal identity. So according to psychological reductionism, Parfit's view, the belief that we are each a separately existing self or subject of experiences, something that exists over and above any bodily continuity and or any series of experiences, is held to be unjustified and we are recommended to reduce the conception of our identity over time by jettisoning this belief, the belief that there was something more than bodily continuity or a series of mental experiences. Uh, that's an inside uh, regional joke between the two of us, by the way. Right. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> uh, the title of the paper is The Different Antilogic and Prudence. And the title refers to the French word for contestation, which was left untranslated in the English version of Jean-Francois Lyotard's major work entitled The Different Phrases in Dispute. This work is a significant contribution to European continental thought in the latter part of the 20th century for its difference, excuse the pun, from that more talked about French neologism of the time, Jacques Derrida's difference, a construal of difference and deferral. 
significant as well are the states it sets, the different end sets, to develop a philosophical politics separate from the politics of academics and of politicians. <clears throat> now this theme of a philosophical politics should interest us. Following Plato, many would have said that philosophy does have a politics, and that is the academy. But the problem with that reading is that the academy exists for its answers, while philosophy exists as a challenge to answers. While the successes of modern life, with the successes of modern life, others would say that philosophy is not useful, that one can't get a job with it. So what politics can philosophy possibly have, given its uselessness and its powerlessness? Answers to this question range from saying with Callicles that philosophy is fine in youth, but politics is for adults, to saying philosophy is filled with abstractions and can't practice politics because politics is the art of the possible. Leotard would respond that philosophy has a different with these answers and the discourses out of which they come. That different appears in a general agonistics, where to speak is to fight, and it is time for philosophy to fight, to save the honor of thinking. Thank you so much, sir. Now, this is what we call true cultural evaluation. An American professor teaching South Asian music to a Bengali, who has come here all over from America to Kolkata to perform. Wow. Okay. So, uh, here we are. May I please invite Indrajit Roy Chaudhuri, who is from the Ramsenia Harana. He is a disciple of Pandit Shubhrata Roy Chaudhuri, graduate of Duke University. And he has studied under Dr. Jonathan Kremo at Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan, New York. Please, uh, uh, sir, and he will be accompanied to Kavla Rai, who is a disciple of Pandit Shubhendu Jatanji. He is, again, an example, a brilliant example of cultural emancipation because he had been born and brought up and he is a resident of German. So here we are with uh, these two musicians, very young and dynamic, and I'm sure we will have an immense musical performance with all this all together. And Greetings, it's a pleasure to see all of you here. Uh, you know, the word serendipity comes from the word serendip, which was the original name of the island of Sri Lanka uh, in Portuguese. And uh, when they saw the island so beautiful, they called it serendip, or the island, I guess, was called serendip in a local language. And so the word serendipity is coming to our language. And the situation that we're facing right at this moment is definitely a serendipitous one. Uh, Indrajit Roy Chowdhury was a student in my Music of South Asia class at Duke University in 1997 or sometime around then. I can't quite remember what year it was. And uh, it was sort of a situation of me carrying calls to Newcastle. I'm teaching a course in South Asian music, and this young man was already at the level of a professional sitarist at that point in his, in his prodigious career. And so I was always sort of looking at him for assurance whenever I made some pronouncement about the nature of music in that in this culture, of which I am not a native, and he very much is. Um, so, at the time, he was, I guess, a sophomore, perhaps. His father is a renowned, and is a renowned uh, researcher and practitioner of hepatology. He's different uh, uh, as a physician, as his specialty. And, and uh, in which it was vacillating between whether he would pursue a career in medicine following the footsteps of his father or following the footsteps of his music world and become a musician. And uh, I must say that I think I took an occasional opportunity to encourage him to pursue music because there are lots of physicians but not very many sitarists that can find their way in the world bring this music to all of us who are not sitarists. Uh, and he didn't do just that, and he's had a distinguished career. So the serendipity part of it is that we're both here in Kolkata at the same time. He lives in New York, and last fall I had brought him down to my institution for a concert. Uh, and 
in the course of our conversation, we realized that we would both be here at the same time. And so here we are. And he's generously offered to perform uh, a recital uh, for our conference. I think that it has been said that music is where philosophy aspires. Uh, we musicians like to think that. Uh, that all of the philosophical questions, the question is why, you know, sort of hold up into a little wall and disappear in the face of music and why music is and what music tells us about our music. So without further ado, I'll bring our hostess back up to the stage to introduce the performance. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's really an honor to be here, uh, especially on the, on the invitation of Dr. Chakraborty and the connection made by my professor, my second guru, uh, Dr. Jonathan Kramer, to be here on the second day of the conference. Yesterday I heard two papers, and I, and I must say it's, it's far out of the realm of my understanding as my uh, career has gone slightly uh, in a direction away from the pure academic aspect. Um, but I think what uh, we'll present today uh, will inform much of uh, what may be spoken about in a conference like this. Uh, as you know, uh, in Indian classical music, we have the raga system in which melodies have a specific time of day with which they're associated. So when we were tuning, we did tune for a morning raga, and it has become afternoon since then. But we won't take up more time with tuning. We'll proceed with the morning raga. As many of you have come from west of here, you're probably on you know, a different time zone anyway. So um, we'll play the morning raga, Ahir Bhairav.
uh, by the two great exponents of classical Indian music. And uh, this is going to be followed by another very, very special performance by another true expert uh, in that field, Professor Su Jin Wu of Fulgong University in Taiwan. Uh, has uh, kindly agreed to present the performance of Tai Chi for us. Uh, she is a very distinguished scholar of philosophy and religion, uh, but also an expert of Tai Chi, and she's going to explain to us uh, uh, what, the, what is the meaning of the performance that she's going to present for us.
some interest to know for you that <coughs> in, at my university, <coughs> the University of Rotten in Finland, recently, I would say during the last five or even ten years, the uh, say strategical focus or the emphasis in research activities has changed a lot. <laughs> my university has been always a kind of uh, business-oriented university, but during the latest years, this kind of business orientation has become more and more obvious. And that has also affected my work. I'm actually the only philosopher at my university, and, and uh, my uh, research focus has changed uh, extremely lot during these latest years. So that all kind of uh, issues related to business life, uh, management and decision making has become uh, more and more important. That is actually something that I first saw that it's, it's uh, an unfortunate situation, but uh, what we can do as individual academics, if the uh, 
university government or, or uh, principals and decision makers want us to have a certain kind of research focus. It means that uh, also individual academics have to change or, or follow the, those strategical decisions. My background, however, has been in, in much more different topics. Actually, I'm originally a theologian, and already in my dissertation, doc doctoral dissertation, the focus was much more in uh, ethical and uh, uh, theological issues related to, to the relationship between ethical issues and some theological issues, especially in the context of Indian religions. I was very much interested in the doctrine or the law of karma. And now in, in today's speech, I somehow try to combine the present uh, focus in my, my research work and, and the previous one, which was uh, very much oriented towards uh, Hindu ideas and, and Buddhist ideas and, and the karma thought or karma idea was very much in the epicenter at, at that time. So this is a kind of combination of the present situation and, and the past. So, in this paper, I will discuss the principle of Nishkarma Karma, or desireless action, in the light of the prisoner's dilemma. That dilemma provides a well-formulated theoretical game context for developing our understanding of desireless action. First, however, I make some general remarks on the concept of Nishkarma Karma and discuss a philosophically relevant translation issue related to the outcomes of desireless action. The Bhagavad Gita, part of the sixth book of the Mahabharata, offers a practical approach to liberation or freedom from the cycle of death and rebirth. This approach is called Karma Yoga, or the Yoga of Action. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna advocates selfless action as the ideal path to realize the truth about oneself and the ultimate reality. According to Krishna, work done without self-centered expectations or thinking about its outcomes tends to purify one's mind. Moreover, action without desires gradually makes an individual fit to see the value of reason and the benefits of renouncing the word itself. The benefits of such renouncing are essentially related to the release from the attachment to worldly bonds and sufferings. The central tenet of the karma yoga path to liberation is the principle of nishkarma karma. Nishkarma karma refers to an action performed without any expectation of fruits or results. Bhagavad Gita terms this, I quote, inaction in action and action in inaction. The concept of such detached action is commonly called Nishkarma Karma, even if the term itself is not used in the Bhagavad Gita. However, there is reason to say that Nishkarma Karma is the central teaching of the Bhagavad Gita. In the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that we have rights only to an action and not to its results, whether the result is good or bad. Therefore, we should not desire for any results. When this request is read with philosophical sensitivity, the request seems problematic and strange because an action and its results are internally related, as the following example shows. I managed to perform uh, the act of opening a window if and only if the window opens by my act. Thus, my opening the window is my dreaming about the windows being open. Accordingly, the relation between the act and its result is intrinsic. One could point out that here we have an example of a loose and ambiguous use of language. The Sanskrit term for the for result in the Bhagavad Gita 2.747 is phala, fruit. Many translations replace it either with the term result or reward. 
Here the term river is related to the idea of karmic merits, the universal moral and a universal moral bookkeeping or uh, accounting in terms of merits as the basis for a reward. What is clear is that the Katabatika distinguishes between an act and its outcomes, whether we call those outcomes results, fruits, or rewards. Thus, in view of the Katabatika, doing a deed is one thing and the result of a deed is another thing. An interpretation that comes easily to mind is that the term result is used vaguely here, incorporating consequences of action. Indeed, in addition to the result, an action can have intended or unintended consequences. While the relation between an act and its result is intrinsic, the relation between an act and its consequences is extrinsic or causal. For example, consequences of opening a window can be fresh air and a fly coming in the room. Fresh air is often an intended consequence, while a fly is most probably an unintended Based on these initial considerations, Krishna's request that we should not desire for any results can be interpreted at least uh, in at least three ways. First, Krishna can be interpreted as telling us to do deeds without striving or taking the trouble to accomplish them. Could this interpretation be wrong? I do not think so. Krishna doesn't advise us to be careless or slackish or even to leave our deeds unfinished. Instead, he suggests we not focus on our own benefit as an outcome of our actions. There is much textual evidence for this view, but due to time limitations, we cannot go into details here. Moreover, Krishna says that performing actions without entanglement in desires will lead to release from the chains of rebirth. Secondly, it thus seems more plausible to interpret Krishna's request as follows. We should do our deeds not striving for selfish gain and benefit, but out of duty. Even though the Bhagavad Gita thus advises us not to focus on one's own benefit, it should be noted that some deeds, for example those related to fulfilling, fulfilling our basic physical needs, such as eating and sleeping, are self-centered such that completing those actions necessarily relate to and include a reference to oneself. One may say that in fulfilling our basic needs, a healthy self-interest is necessary. In regard to the Bhagavad Gita's concept of the human person, it is also worth noting that Atman, or the true inmost self, is not the agent or doer of deeds, but an observer and advisor by Krishna, the charioteer to Prince Aryuna. In the Bhagavad Gita, Aryuna, the commander of the Bandava army, hesitates before the battle at Kurukshetra as he is shot as at fighting his Kaurava relatives. Aryuna orders his charioteer to withdraw, but the man, Krishna, argues with him. Krishna urges Aryuna to ready himself for battle, to regard pleasure and pain gain and loss, and victory and failure as one and the same. Only when Ayuna has renounced interest in the fruits of his actions can he find true peace. This discussion between Krishna and Ayuna has been traditionally understood as implying that the doer of deeds is Jiva, or the empirical or seeming self, having mind and body. Moreover, according to the Bhagavad Gita, Salvation ultimately comes from the recognition that the true self is not Shiva, the doer, and thus the true self does not reap the fruits of action either. The true or transcendental self, Atman, is concerned about moral duties and focused on observing and evaluating the action of the empirical self, while the empirical self is concerned about obtaining benefits and the results of action. Consequently, Salvation is not only an ethical issue in the Bhagavad Gita, but also a serious untold epistemological issue. The true understanding of the self and ultimate reality is intrinsic to salvation. To put the forepoint in the nutshell, 
The Papa Vatsita teaches us that we should do our duty and should advance the common good. At the same time, we should understand that Atman, or the inmost self, is not a doer of deeds, but rather an advice, observer and advisor. Let us come back to Krishna's request that we should not desire for any reasons. Jordi Henrik von Frick gives us means for a third interpretation of that request. According to that interpretation, when acting, we should focus on the change corresponding to our act and not on the end state. A suitable metaphor for this interpretation would be the Chen Archery, the Chen Archery competition, where the archer is advised to keep his or her attention focused on shooting and not on scoring. Similarly, one can say that the control performance of a gymna gymnastic routine is more important than the points or reward given by a jury. In this context, the Western Aristotelian distinction between doing and making, or action and production, appears to be applicable. Gymnastics as well as dance and music are what Aristotle calls action, praxis. The end of action is not separate from the activity itself, but included in it. Making or production, for yes, in turn, is an activity in which the end or result is separate from the activity itself. Such is the case, for example, in house building and thesis writing. In view of the aforesaid, Krishna can be interpreted as advising us that we should concentrate on doing or performance itself and not keep our sights on the outcome or end state of our activities. Possible situation types in which one does something without thinking about the outcomes are the following. First, one does not wait for anything of one's own acts. One just acts. Second, one is in a flow state or so deeply immersed in what one is doing that one performs an action without thinking about its results or consequences. Or third, one acts like an unconscious automaton or robot and does not know or understand what one is doing. The first two alternatives, not waiting for anything and acting in a flow state, are more plausible interpretations of Krishna's request. He does not make any reference to acting unconsciously. A relevant but seemingly contradictory question is in what way and to what extent this karma karma or desireless action can advance us. In answering this, we should first know that based on the four-point analysis, desireless does not mean purposeless, indifferent, or unintentional. Instead, it means dutiful, that is, consensually or obediently fulfilling one's duty, or motivated by duty, rather than desire or enthusiasm. Moreover, we can point out that because duty means an obligation, fulfilling one's duty is by definition, obligatory and necessary. In regard to psychological benefits, acting without desire can produce as a byproduct freedom from stress, <coughs> a relaxed performance, and life with less disappointments, because expectations are not directed towards success or failure, but towards fulfilling duties. The possible harms of acting without desire, in turn, include negligence, impassiveness, and too much relaxedness. Based on the aforesaid, Krishna's advice that we should not desire for any results should be interpreted either as the obligation to act unselfishly and out of duty, or as the request to concentrate on doing and not on the outcome. It should be clear that these two interpretations are compatible, not exclusive. We can both act altruistically and concentrate on performance of what we are doing. Even though we have already achieved a plausible understanding of how to interpret Krishna's advice, we should not decide for any results. The prisoner's dilemma gives us a means to introduce a fourth interpretation can be expressed as follows. Be indifferent when choosing between actions and leave the decision to chance. At face value, this interpretation is problematic because it ignores the focus on duties that is central in Krishna's advice to Arjuna. Nevertheless, to better understand and see the point of the fourth interpretation, let us have a look at the prisoner's dilemma. 
The prisoner's dilemma is a fictional story of a decision making this uh, situation in which individuals seeking their own benefit end up with a worse outcome that could be achieved through cooperation. In addition, the dilemma is used to demonstrate decision making under risk and uncertainty. Game and decision theorists have actively discussed the prisoner's dilemma and have, have proposed different analyses. The dilemma was first formulated in 1950 by Mary Flood and Mary Tresser and formalized by Albert Tucker. According to the story, John and Mary, the accomplices to a crime, have been caught and are threatened by imprisonment. John and Mary are unable to communicate they can remain silent or expose each other. If both remain silent, each receives a one-year sentence. Again, if one snitches, he or she goes free, while the partner is jailed for three years. If both confess, each receives a two-year sentence. The problem here is that whatever one chooses, the other had better confess, even though the common good would be that both remain silent. Thus, the prisoner who seeks his or her own benefit chooses snitching and ensures a shorter sentence for himself or herself, rather than remain silent and risk a long sentence. <coughs> if both confess, the total sentence is four years. If both remain silent, the total sentence is only two years. Although John and Mary are <coughs> rationally when they seek their own benefit, they get a worse outcome that could be obtained through cooperation. This collectively suboptimal outcome depends on the absence of an enforceable agreement or intrinsic trust between the prisoners and a lack of information about each other's intentions. Rationality and self-interest force both prisoners to betray the other and thus choose an outcome that was worse for both of them than the outcome they would have agreed upon if they had cooperated and so to minimize the total number of years in prison. This shows that what is optimal for each risk averse individual need not coincide with what is collectively optimal. <coughs> the prisoner's dilemma helps precisely recognize and present the two basic strategies of decision making, focusing on self-interest and pursuing the common good. Moreover, the dilemma shows that these strategies do not necessarily go hand in hand. This is in fact something that Krishna indirectly points out in the Bhagavad Gita when he warns not to work for one's own benefit. One might want to defend an even stronger view of the core of the prisoner's dilemma. According to that view, the only genuinely altruistic strategy to realize the combination of a short sentence and help the accomplice is to remain silent, even with the risk that the accomplice confesses, because altruism requires accepting the risk that one's self-interest remains unfulfilled. Moreover, what is interesting from the perspective of moral theories is that both act and rule utilitarians could support the view that both prisoners should remain silent, because the greatest good for the greatest number would be achieved in this particular case, and in general, <coughs> Provided that no persons other than those two were men that were mentioned in the story are involved. Kantian, the ontologist, in turn, could argue that both prisoners ought to tell the truth and confess, because telling the truth is a duty, Kant says, and not something to be decided on a case by case basis. Having said this, it is also important to know the following. It is an arbitrary feature of the dilemma that is about prisoners confessing and remaining silent. Of course we can say that there is pro tanto or prima facie duty to tell the truth. Despite prison being the surface context of the story, the dilemma is more deeply about the conflict between individual benefit and mutual advantage. In the context of the prisoner's dilemma, one or the other of the following decision-making strategies is feasible for prisoners who want to follow the principle of desireless action. A. To be indifferent and to leave the decision to chance, for example, by arbitrarily throwing lots, or B. To pursue the common good or the benefit of the other by remaining silent, instead of seeking to benefit oneself by confessing. As was seen, 
strategy B is ethically more appropriate and follows Krishna's advice in the Bhagavad Gita, assuming the following. Those who want to act without desire, that is, the followers of the principle of Nishkama Karma, can be goal-oriented and target-driven as long as unselfish goals are considered, while remaining indifferent and non-attached in terms of personal benefit. From the perspective of the prisoner's dilemma, the desirelessness of an action has to be addressed in relation to the following options. First, to act self-interestedly and maximize one's own benefit or minimize harm to oneself. Or second, to act collaboratively and altruistically and maximize the collective benefit or the benefit of the other. Confessing and remaining silent are the concrete actions by, this, by which these options are realized in the prisoner's dilemma. An indicator of indifference would be that neither of the given options is considered eligible and neither is sought after. According to the first Nishkama Karma interpretation of the prisoner's dilemma, action without desire, uh, action without desire means that none of these are aimed at one's own benefit the collective benefit or the benefit of the other. However, if the choice has to be made, the desireless or indifferent way is to draw lots or otherwise leave the decision to chance. Obviously, the Bhagavad Gita, or the principle of this karma, for that matter, does not recommend that decisions concerning human actions should be reached by resorting to chance. Thus, the Bhagavad Gita does not recommend the freedom of indifference or arbitrary randomness. In, instead, we are exhorted to do our duty. What is then the other way for an action to be desired? Based on the principle of this karma karma, we can answer as follows. We should opt for the second alternative and act collaboratively and altruistically, instead of acting egoistically and self-interestedly. This means that even if we should not aim at receiving the fruits of our actions for ourselves, we should aim for the common good and, ben and the benefit of and good consequences for others. The following advice from the chapter 3 of the Bhagavad Gita shows this clearly. I quote, Let thy aim be the good of all, and then carry on thy task in life. This was from the verse 3, 20. However, one may still ask whether an altruistic or collaborative motive for action really represents desireless or disinterested action. One way to answer this is, it depends on the point of view. From a moral point of view, one can say that altruistic action is desireless because it, by definition, is not based on the desire for one's own benefit. On the other hand, all action requires intentional action as Donald Davidson pointed out. An altruistic or collaborative action is no exception. If one's intention is to maximize the collective benefit or the benefit of the other, and if the person so intended knows what could make his or her intention true, then he or she intends to perform an action that is not desireless, at least not in any absolute sense, but desire. David Collier has presented the following solution to the prisoner's dilemma. He argues that when the prisoner's dilemma is iterated or repeated for numerous rounds with the same persons, so the prisoners <coughs> come to know what kind of person the other one is and what his or her decision strategy is. It is rational for them to cooperate if one thinks that one is playing against a cooperatively minded person. Otherwise, it is rational to play a non-cooperative strategy. Therefore, what is essential here is trust in the other person's cooperativeness. Such trust can be achieved either through one's own observations of the other person's behavior in repeated decision-making situations, or through the other people's testimony. Cotier articulates this claim by distinguishing between two kinds of utility maximizing individuals, namely straightforward maximizers who always strive for their self-interest and refuse to cooperate, 
and constraint maximizers who cooperate with fellow constraint maximizers, but not with straightforward maximizers. Moreover, Cortier argues that individuals will choose to dispose themselves as constraint maximizers rather than straightforward maximizers. That is, to re retrain themselves not to think of their self-interest first, but rather dispose themselves to keep their agreements if they find themselves in an environment of like-minded individuals. When the principle of Nishkama Karma is applied to Collier's solution, the following interpretation of the prisoner's dilemma becomes available. Both prisoners should follow the principle of Nishkama Karma. In Collier's terminology, such persons are constrained maximizers because they want to maximize the common good but do not aim at maximizing their individual benefits. However, the reservation must be as regards this interpretation. Those who follow the principle of this karma karma should also cooperate with straightforward maximizers, or those who do not follow the principle of this karma karma, and should not only cooperate with the like-minded people, that is, fellow, fellow constraint maximizers. This is so because only then the followers of the principle of this karma karma really observe Krishna's request that we should not desire for any reasons. As a concluding words, <coughs> uh, I have discussed the Bhagavad Gita doctrine of this karma karma, or altruistic action that is performed without expectation of fruit. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that we have rights only to an action and not to its results, whether the result is good or bad. Therefore, we should not decide for any reasons. In this paper, I have distinguished between different interpretations of Krishna's request. Based on the textual evidence, the statement that we have rights only to an action and not to its fruits should be interpreted either as an obligation to act unselfishly and out of duty, or as the request to concentrate on doing and not on the outcome. The prisoner's dilemma shows that of these two interpretations, the duty-based or common good-oriented interpretation is more advantageous because following it maximizes the collective debt. Thank you. General Degree College, Kolkata, India. Her uh, lecture is on Transnational Kavyals, Kavigan and its Rhythmic Reincarnation in Jatishar uh, Film. Jatishar Film. Okay. It's very interesting. Uh, hello, everybody. I uh, feel a really an odd person out today because I'm the only one perhaps who teaches literature. The rest are all philosophers. Okay, fine. I got <laughs> two, three. <laughs> that that is very, very encouraging for me. Uh, you know, when I was uh, going through the uh, conference, CFP, and all, I was in two minds whether as to I must, you know, I must send an abstract or not. But then I thought that okay, it's an interdisciplinary conference, so let me squeeze in. And I have uh, what I've tried to bring in today is far away from uh, not only the time, but since. I see uh, all of you coming down to India, and particularly to West Bengal, uh, Calcutta being the, the capital. I would take you back to a Bengal of 18th century, okay? And uh, see, my my focus are of three folds. Firstly, it is about a movie, a Bengali movie, Jati Shor, which means reincarnation. This movie was released in the year 2014 and it has got many national awards. Uh, the movie is focused on a particular 
uh, aspect of Bengali folk culture, which is Kobi Gan. Kobi is the poet and Gan is song. And those who used to practice this particular genre was, was known as the Kabiyals, okay, or the chief song smiths. I am Shambhu Mitra Dashgupta from uh, 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 of Department of Philosophy. I belong to this college. Uh, today I uh, would like to present the paper titled Feminist Spirituality and Motherhood and Indian Perspective. Actually, um, I want to relate the motherhood concept from the perspective of personhood concept of India. In Indian tradition. Uh, you know that uh, feminism uh, is a movement, uh, it is a movement against discrimination and uh, subordination, exploitation, etc. etc. Uh, that um, exist in the society uh, in general and specifically, and uh, particularly uh, against women. Uh, and uh, a group of women, uh, they are plead uh, for a vision of wholeness of the world in, uh, and uh, they relate it uh, to a kind of spirituality that can be able to create uh, the new vision of multidimensional perspective of the world instead of a single and decisive vision. This play is related to feminist spirituality. Spirituality. It concerns with the set of integral, poly, integral, holistic, dynamic, and life affirming spiritual values. And uh, they claim that these values, women possess these values due to uh, her, her, her biological and socio cultural structure. Actually, the highlights in the history of civilization is actually the story of man's victory over the body, the non-human being, and finally over the nature. It considers freedom as an ongoing process of emancipation from uh, emancipation of man from nature. And uh, on the uh, and patriarchy uh, uh, decodomizes the reality into two parts, and the most significant sign uh, sign of this decodomization is that it is not only says the one superior to the other, but considers the other as the enemy. In this system, liberalism means independence of individuality, ignoring all intricate relationship and interdependence. Therefore, the history of development and progress of man is actually the history of constant war of man against the other. As the worldview of the patriarchal system considers the other as enemy, aggressiveness and violence become the very nature of it, and the inequality in the area of sex, race, and other, along with environmental degradation, can expand its branches within this system in value. The patriarchal society gives more emphasis on aggressiveness, a sense of position, domination, independence, etc., which are known as masculine traits. On the contrary, it underweights the values like care, a sense of belongingness, attachments, interdependence, which are known as feminine traits. Like other feminists, the battle of feminist spiritualists is with the dichotomization of reality manifested through our many dualistic thinking. Feminist spiritualist desires to participate and get power almost in every one of the, uh, human activities. The attainment of power is no doubt necessary to change the position of women in the society, but at the same time she criticizes the existing dimension of power which keeps separate the political world from other human experiences like caring, interconnection, attachment. As it is, our politics fails to realize the spiritual vision of life. Feminist <coughs> uh, spiritualities develops a sense of uh, kinship and bonding instead of inter uh, independence. 
spend spiritual is considered the spiritual resources are needed for achieving an intuitive and holistic vision of power which is humanistic as well as not exploitative. The quest gives a spiritual dimension of feminism within contemporary feminism. Spirituality may be considered as a process of transformation and trans development, an organic and dynamic part of human development which includes the development of the individual and the society as well. Lamentariness of compassion is a positive emotion connected with spirituality. In the conversation with Paul Ekman, the Dalai Lama states, quote unquote, uh, compassion or loving kindness does not develop spontaneously but through training, through reasoning. The family spiritualist claims that a woman can cultivate this emotional aspect because of her social and cultural construction. Her immense resource of sufferings is one of the sources of strength to overcome adversity and afflictions. As a mother, the woman has the direct experiences of conceiving new light, giving birth, nurturing and sustaining of it. It gives a higher value and for her. Sorry. Although women, although women has often been peacemakers in family, there is no public recognition of it in the patriarchal society. What the family spiritualist thinks, it needs an ontological foundation on which the new dimension of power may be formed. Indian vast philosophical thoughts <coughs> are specially, uh, in, uh, uh, can highlight uh, uh, it. Indian thoughts are specially very much flourished by the Vedantic truth that we all inherit in divinity and the very goal of humanity is to rediscover the divinity within ourselves. The divinity is the basic principle of developing our sense of kinship and bonding. The presence of a divine reality has been revealed to the inner mind in the personality of the visible mother. Within the limited circle of our motherhood, a mother is an example of self-transcendence through her self-effacement. That is why in India, motherhood is more glorified than fatherhood. The Mono City, the most important and authoritative ancient Indian law book, states that from the point of view of reverence D, a teacher is tenfold superior to a mere lecturer, a father a hundredfold to a teacher, and a mother a thousandfold to a father. In Indian culture, in, in, in Indian cultural heritage, motherhood is ideal for womanhood. It uses to connect the spirit of motherhood with womanhood. Motherhood stimulates the deepening dependence and is a recognition of the extension of first person awareness to others. <coughs> the uh, Buddhist ethics, we uh, see that in Buddhist ethics, we see that uh, there has been mentioned the uh, Brahma Dhyana Bhavana. The Brahma Dhyana Bhavana consisting of Koruna Bhavana, Medha Bhavana, Mudita Bhavana, and Rupiksa Bhavana, and these are the ideal state of mind in Buddhism. It is the state of mind where the mind is not affected by anger, selfishness, and other negative emotions, but remains in the state of kinship with others, other persons. In this state, mind feels others' pains and sufferings as his or her own, it is Koruna Bhavana and possesses a sense of loving kindness to others. It is Medha Bhavana. Enjoys others' happiness. It is, it is Mudita Bhavana and is capable to keep the mind indifference from any sufferings and happiness of his or her own. It is Upeksha Bhavana. A close scrutiny discloses that these four Bhavanas are actually the different states of mother's experiences in respect of her child. When her child is in suffer, mother feels the suffering as her own suffering. When the child becomes young and enjoys the beauty of life in all aspects, she also enjoys her happiness and remains indifferent without interfering in the circle of her child's life, the child who becomes matured enough. From Indian perspective, motherhood is a journey 
from individuality to personhood. In which a person consciously begins to achieve the spiritual growth, which means the emergence of ethical awareness and the capacity to and to be lived by others. Only in her mothering resources, she can touch the goal of since she can touch the goal uh, by, uh, simply by growing her motherhood, not merely, even necessarily biological, but certainly spiritual. It is said uh, say by uh, Swami Ramanathananda, uh, uh, he was a monk of Ramakrishna order. Swami um, Vivekananda, one of the pioneers of religious pluralism, contributed much to the regeneration, uh, religious pluralism, uh, he uh, marched to the regeneration of Indian women. He desired to connect motherhood concept with women's empowerment. In Indian cultural heritage, women is called Shakti Sarva. The Indian mythology imagines Devi Durga as also as Dasho Buja, having taken hands with various weapons to kill the evil spirit Asura. Motherhood is the combination of Shakti and Koruna. That is uh, power and loving kindness. And we are saying, without this positive emotional feelings, can never bring peace in the world but aggressiveness and violence. Strength must be related with love and passion. From the broad perspective, the traits which are culturally and socially associated with womanhood are not exclusive in this sense that even a man can become a mothering person. It is a positive emotional awareness which increases through the cultivation of unselfish love and complete self abnegation irrespective of division of sex. It is spiritual in the sense that persons who possess it can feel the first person awareness towards others and transform their individuality into a person. This is the true aspect of human excellence. The Buddha, the Christ who contributed to the welfare of humankind, possesses that type of mothering personality. From what has been said, it follows that the struggle for establishment a new vision of power, which can create a sense of interdependence and interconnecting way, is structurally inherited in women. Such a vision can be emerged from Indian concept of personhood and the law and the long journey of Indian cultural heritage, which sometimes flourished with the beautiful fragrance of non-violence, is the result of its feminization of personhood. The ultimate goal of human life, what the world needs today, is need to extend the woman's experiences to the domain of the public, to cultivate the spiritual heritage that the woman possesses in the realm of the public and uh, in the realm of politics. These two are denied uh, presently in the public sector. Uh, in fact, spirituality is not merely related to interiority and inwardness but closely connected to all other domain of human experiences, be it social or political. The connection between the inner and outer, personal and political, can increase the health of social and political life. To purify politics and governance, Mahatma Gandhi was strongly in favor of feminization of public life. Women are described by Gandhi as the incarnation of Ahimsa. For him, now that is non-violence. For him, Ahimsa means infinite love. It presupposes infinite capacity for suffering which woman embodies. According to him, if non violent is a law of our being, the future then with women, it was given to who had deep and firm confidence that only women powered with motherhood can fight against all evils and bring peace and harmony. But visual media is encouraging women to follow a male-dominated culture. Women are shown based on their body and traditional gender image in popular media, while uh, women are always con uh, also consuming such representation as fact. Bengali cinema dedicated itself to chasing cinematic excellence. Uh, 
and but there are four other movies also that reflect not only women as a uh, glamour as glamorous daughter of rich father attend who attend party disco and uh, wear short dresses. There are other movies also which reflect the real woman who is very close to the middle class family. She has to earn her livelihood. She is a shade of the family under whom the entire family survives. She has to compromise in every sphere of life. Uh, analysis of representation, in particular in television, is a key component to understand the significance of the medium and the meaning which it constructs for its audiences. Uh, do, uh, here uh, we will concentrate, another question will arise that whether major female characters in some television serials and soap operas defy gender stereotyping or do they concentrate and sustain the image of submissive, secondary and dominated sex within family and society? <coughs> do women characters that defy stereotypes in some way uh, or other through a positive, progressive or alternative definition of women or do they delineate negative stereotypes or submitting to sponsored or audience? When he says, quote, Inception is remarkable for its seeming failure to explore any paradoxical Escheresque typologies, unquote, because spectacle does not invite one to explore so much as it suspends that faculty. One just watches, free for a time, from the responsibility to chain a tale together. And this film serves up a spectacle like hot cakes. Car chases, firefights, a, a, a raging mob, incendiary explosions, etc., such as one encounters in generic action pictures. So much so that Mark considers, quote, the prolonged action sequences come off as perfunctory at best, unquote. Similarly, Andrew O'Hare, another critic, expresses his feeling that Inception's spectacle devolves into gratuitousness when he writes of the film, quote, the way it went one way and then went another way, unquote. O'Hare's Two prolonged undulation corresponds to what Julia Ada finds when she classifies Inception as a quote, heist movie with a mind bending premise and cool explosion, unquote, insofar as the film will radiosity as easily as it will coarsely explode. The paradoxical extras pathologies bend the mind, while the stuff at the snow fortress blows up real good, as Roger Ebert used to say. The story ceases to progress as armed men chase Cobb through the streets of Mombasa, or Yusuf's van careens through a rainy Los Angeles. And I have some clips of examples of this kind of spectacle. My first time, it never, it never, it never ceases to fail. Or directly. And this is their means of livelihood. So originally their main occupation was hunting. Afterwards they were uh, into a lot of you know animal rearing. So mainly they rear goats and a few sheep. And the way the Koreans consider the cow very very pure. The cow is a mother. But these people consider cows very very impure. So they do not allow cows in their village. They do not have any cow milk or cow yogurt, they have goat's milk and goat yogurt. And the reason for that is because actually uh, when they uh, migrated from Gilgit into Ladakh, if you look at the terrain, they actually live in very, very rocky mountains where actually goats can climb easily, but a cow would not be able to manage that. And one or two families in a village, you know, they tried keeping a cow, but the cow does not give any milk at all because even the cow probably within is very, very stressed in their environment. Okay. So they make goat yogurt and that is how they survive. And earlier, yes, in winters, they used to have goat meat, but now after taking up a Buddhism, they are discouraged from having anything that is non-vegetarian. And yes, agriculture is very, very important for them. Only women undertake agriculture. Yeah, men do not work on the fields. Men take animals to the pastures to graze and women take care of the fields. So they have wheat, barley and besides that a lot of other fruits and vegetables. So basically their religion 
it is termed by the tibetans and the ladakhis as bone chose bone is considered a very very old practice which is which refers to nature worship and shamanism so they basically know that the earth is responsible for giving them all their crops and all their food and that is the reason that they ultimately want to show their reverence to nature so they believe that nature is the ultimate expression of the creator and it is the earth which is responsible so basically they want to protect all aspects of nature and till some 50 years back they were self sufficient not a single thing was imported from outside the village Uh, so I'm going to talk some and read some, and at the end I'll play some videos that relate to uh, uh, the subject of the talk. Uh, and I'm going to be—I'll explain it further as I go along. But I'm going to be using the concept of sacred and profane that was brought up in the previous, uh, the previous uh, talk, at which I was sort of hoping when you mentioned it that you would elaborate. On what they meant by sacred and profane, because these are highly contentious concepts and and aren't necessarily the same in every culture, and that's one of the problems that I'm going to be unpacking in the course of this paper. The 23rd annual World Sacred Music Festival took place in Fez, Morocco, on June 22nd through June 30th, 2017. An advertisement for the festival, published in European newspapers, announced international announced quote internationally renowned artists from around the world flock to Morocco's spiritual capital for the annual Fez Festival of World Sacred Music and perform a variety of styles from Moroccan Sufi chants, Pakistani Qawwali incantations, and Egyptian Mali odes to flamenco-style Christian sayeta. Uh, ancient Indian Gwalior chants and Turkish whirling dervishes. Over the course of the event, musicians from France to Rajasthan find common ground with collaborative performances culminating the program and celebrate this festival of sacred music. The 2017 festival theme was water and the sacred, and it coincided with a major international academic symposium on the future of the world's water resources. Previous festivals had showcased such themes as women in the sacred, or world cultures in the sacred, or focus on Africa, etc. The goals of the festival, since its inception, have been ecumenical and a seeking for common ground among the world's religions. While some traditions hold that all music, by its very nature, is sacred. Others propose clear boundaries between the sacred and the secular, and yet others consider all music suspect. That music is in fact a distraction from the spiritual life and has no place in religious ritual. While some forms of sacred music or an equivalent category, such as chant, cantillation, or melodic prayer, are almost universally incorporated in religious ritual, the kind of music considered as sacred and therefore appropriate in religious contexts has been the subject of intense debate. In the case of the 2017 Fez Music Festival, the category of the sacred of sacred music itself was blurry at best. Fusion bands and celebrity stars predominated, and while there were some ancient traditions highlighted, such as Sufi chants performed by Kuwaiti pearl divers, most of the music was contemporary and not so different from what might have been heard on a Saturday night in a hit Parisian dance club. This paper explores the ramifications of the concept of the sacred in a postmodern world as performed at the 2017. Fez Festival. The theme of the conference, and if you combine the theme of this conference with the next conference, adding I think globalism, morality, and environmentalism, we're just covering the whole, the whole of just the hottest topics I think raging throughout uh, at least the Western liberal societies, which are questions of personal like person and identity, and culture, and globalization, and uh, I guess. Traditional forms of identity versus newer or more expansive, inclusive forms of identity, and voila, we have a, a topic that <clears throat> I think zeroes in at a crucial moment <clears throat> of what I would call the culture wars, the culture conf 
that has pretty much been going on since, I'd say, the mid-1960s, certainly in the American context. Um, and uh, uh, I think we're seeing, and again, I'm not even looking at my notes, which is probably dangerous, but with the Brexit vote, with the Trump, uh, with the, the presidential election, um, with uh, big debates over immigration and refugees, uh, controversies surrounding new, newer forms of identity, which I'm sure have been around, I shouldn't call those newer forms, but the phenomenon of transgenderism. Um, and coming from North Carolina, I can look to Jonathan. Uh, you know, it's a, you know I, I, I'm living in South Carolina, which is just a, it's, it's unambiguously a red state. But North Carolina voted for Trump in 2008, excuse me, voted for Obama in 2008. It voted for Trump in uh, 2016. And in the same election that North Carolina voted for Trump, they booted out the governor who uh, was responsible for this bathroom law that was you know, so controversial. So go figure. In other words, all kinds of things are moving in, in uh, various directions in terms of uh, uh, how the general public is perceiving these great questions or these issues that are all about identity and different points of identity. is transcendental in nature, arising from one and the only source, the divine. For the artist, it lies in the act of creation, while for the spectators, it lies in the act of observation. The degree of aesthetic fulfillment is in the hands of the artist. By imbibing the divine expressions, the Rasas, in his or her art, he or she is able to achieve a higher degree of aesthetic gratification and perfection. Bharata speaks of the nine rasas, the sources of which lie in different bhavs or moods. Sringara, erotic or dealing with sexual desire, originates from Rati, like stuff. Thank you. 
श्री सनाथ यामी विरह विधोर कुसुम हार भई न भार विनयार अथर उठई कापिया सखी करे कर आपिया अथर उठई कापिया सखी करे कर आपिया कुंज भवन आपिया सुनल बाधिका राख कुसुम मानिकु समीर संचली हर शिथिल मृदु समीर संचल हर शिथिल अंश 